noted Monday at four. Are we up and running? Yeah, we are now yep. recording. Okay. So I'll open a municipal budget overview and projected revenue meeting and all counselors except for Councillor Osher are present and I'll turn it over to our town manager. Well, hello everyone. So we we met and had a pre-budget workshop where we talked a little bit about the economic climate and I got some direction from council around what you wanted with um, the budget. I have tried to present that and we are in the final stages of um, proofreading the budget and it's set to go to the printer either Saturday, Friday or Saturday, which you'll have it Monday, we have been promised. So um, I wanted to take some time today to set the stage with the budget so that although you don't have it in front of you, you'll have a sense of some of my concern and um, what we tried to do with the budget when you read it, you'll be able to kind of understand um, some new elements of the budget. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So the first thing I wanna do is remind folks that um, the budget is a work plan. It, um, we think about it in terms of dollars and cents, but it really is, um, a work plan that should reflect the visions and the values of the community. Um, those visions and values um, are kind of filtered through in a process of implementation planning where we're going to look at available resources, legal and regulatory requirements, expected employment practices, and impacts on other priorities. So what I mean by that is you have this grand vision of what you want Orono to be, and you give that to staff, and staff's job is to work with you around cutting that into bite-sized pieces, developing the plan for the year, and how operationally we're gonna move things forward. Is that making sense and kind of jives with the process we use here? I think it's really important for the public to understand the roles and responsibilities with that. That it's town council's job to articulate the vision and the values and to establish the priorities. It's town council's job to determine the service levels that we're going to deliver. And ultimately, you are charged with approving the budget. So my team and I work to create this work plan. We say, we think this is what council wants from us. This is what the vision and the values are. And here's the service level. This is how we think we can achieve that. And we kind of create the scope of how operations have to function to be able to do that. Then the next step is that we put the cost to that. And um, looking short term, that's an annual cost, but really there is a longer term cost that we should always be thinking about as well. Our job is to tell you what it's gonna take to um, deliver the services um, that meet the vision that you have. And then our job, once we let that budget go, is to provide you technical guidance. It's not our job to decide what should or shouldn't happen. It's our job to tell you what the impacts might be, but for council to make those choices. Is that? So when we think about the vision and the priorities, they're really formed in or informed in a lot of ways. Um, you guys look at the comprehensive plan, you um, think a lot about operational best practices. You get feedback from the community. You get technical guidance from staff. You have your own professional development and relationships with other elected officials. You pay attention to what's happening in other communities. And you also have your own personal experience. And I would say personal experience and personal agenda are two very different things. 
So I gave you guys an assignment over the weekend and there was a purpose for that. The assignment I gave for those who might be listening is I asked counselors to quickly, without doing any research, um, shoot me the name of one, two or more communities that they felt um, they wanted Orono to be like. So I said, you could think of it in terms of you wanted to offer services like dot, 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 or you wanted amenities like dot, 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 or you wanted them to be like dot, dot, dot. I will tell you what I learned from that is that in general, council has pretty uniform vision of Orono in terms of, I think you want a clean, well-maintained, quaint community that while offering, um, having amenities and offering services still feels like kind of small town because even some of the larger communities that you named were still kind of had that feel. So this was the result. You wanted us to be like Bath, Brunswick, Belfast, Brewer, Camden, Farmington, Yarmouth, Machias, Ellsworth, Belmouth, and Hamden. And I left off Cohasset, Massachusetts, because I couldn't, I, I did not have ready access to the comparables. But do you notice there's kind of a theme there, right? It's that mids that they, they kind of all do go together. So I had one counselor ask me why I did the, the exercise. And it's because as I put the budget together, I came to the conclusion that um, as we've kind of danced around the edges for a while, that Orono's vision and desire, I think is outweighing its ability to pay. Um, unless you put a tax rate much higher. Um, so I wanted, I, I want to show you what this looks like. Population wise, you guys were spot on. We are right in that general group. Valuation wise, we are way off. So we have four, this is based on um, 2018 data because it was the most recent data that I could find the same for everybody. So it's 2018. We have $488 million worth of taxable value. When you get up into Brunswick and Falmouth, they have over $2.5 billion. So you'd say, why does that matter if you weren't steeped in municipal government? It matters because you take the number of dollars you need to raise in commitment and you divide it by the value to get the tax rate. Higher the tax rate, the more money people are gonna pay. Then also comparing tax commitment. Um, you, know, you notice that Brunswick, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Gorham, and almost Bath all have tax commitments that exceed um, or at, are at or exceed $20 million a year. Our tax commitment in this slide was $12.5 million. So we don't have as many dollars to work with as those communities do. So when we look at comparables on paper, population wise, we are the 19th largest community in the state. We are the second largest community in Penobscot County. So there is no question that we are in that Falmouth, Kennebunk, Standish, Wells, Kittery, Brewer. Brewer has got a couple thousand less than we have. On the valuation side, um, we are in line with Vinyl Haven, Waldeboro, Bethel, Georgetown, Lincolnville, and Wiscasset. So those are small towns. And tax commitment wise, South Berwick, Hamden, 
Lisbon, Harpswell, Agunquit for their 728 year round residents and thousands of seasonal residents, and Berwick. So it shows us that as we've known all along, we have high population and some of our, a lot of our services are driven per capita. A lot of our um, public safety services and needs are, are based on a per capita um, use. The, um, but we don't have a lot of value. What was kind of interesting to me is um, how close Hamden and Orono are. So I actually dug into that a little bit because the uh, one of the counselors that said they liked Hamden, but it was for the schools and um, that we wouldn't be able to afford that. It was really interesting for me to see that in Hamden, they, um, they pay what we pay for schools. Um, so that was kind of a, I, I hadn't expected that. I expected it to be more. So then we talk about kind of what comes out of those, um, that commitment, that commitment goes to pay for debt in the county and schools and capital investments and regulatory compliance and public safety and public works, um, economic development, uh, the library, the, the pool, um, all of the things that we need to do to be able to assess um, and collect property taxes and pay our bills. Um, there's a lot of things that are in there that, um, that we are um, supporting through that $12 million. So uh, a week has gone by. I've had a few webinars and uh, listening very closely to my municipal counterparts. And unfortunately, uh, it is as foggy today as it was when we met last week around how this economic downturn is going to impact um, the community. I look at, um, you know, I think in every profession there are people that you look to as kind of being the, the um, folks that have a lot of experience and the leaders and I've been really listening to what they've been saying and there is a distinct um, split. There are those who think that um, this is going to be a blip and a pause is a good idea and um, that uh, we shouldn't um, respond as if the sky is falling. And then there are those who quite frankly are responding like the sky is falling. Um, and um, what, I, what I can tell you I know is that our needs probably aren't going to decrease, that I'm not seeing um, needs decreasing. I'm seeing calls for services in a different way as opposed to no calls for service, if that is making any sense. Um, outside of gas prices dropping, we just bought gas for 75 cents a gallon, bulk bulk gas. Yeah, unheard of. Um, outside of that, I'm not seeing any major price drops. Um, I can tell you when I put this budget together, I was not able to use the traditional revenue forecasting methods I'd be used to doing, you know, taking a five-year rolling average of building permits or, or doing things like that. Um, and I also know that um, we have three pots of money outside of property tax that would be most likely to be impacted by um, the downturn in the economy. So when we talk about revenue sharing, um, we had been anticipating almost $500,000 increase in revenue sharing this year. And we had walked towards that with some, um, we knew we were making some choices on labor, um, agreements. We um, had pushed some capital projects forward, um, thinking that, you know, there was a little bit of a, a ledge there, but we were going to be able to make it up over. So instead of a $500,000 increase, we're looking, at, I am projecting that we would bring in 70% of what was for 
originally forecasted. So I've got that down to uh, 1.4 million, which is $110,000 less than what we brought in or what we were scheduled to bring in this year. Excise tax. Um, so in many communities, they are looking at, uh, so excise tax is the tax that we get when people register their vehicles. It's supposed to be used, um, the idea of it is it's to offset costs associated with maintaining and roads, both maintenance and capital. Um, we thought we were gonna bring in about $780,000 this year. Um, we were on, on trend to bring in almost $30,000 more than that. Um, I've had some conversation. There are managers out there that are assuming that no new cars will be purchased next year. I don't know that that is right for Orono. Um, in Orono, we see an awful lot of leased vehicles. We see an awful lot of, um, even new cars were coming in. Um, I did almost $10,000 worth of excise on new cars two weeks ago. So um, I, I'm not in this budget. I have simply kept the trend at what it was. I did not move forward the growth that I had originally anticipated when I was putting the budget together. Charges for services is another fairly large cost center or revenue center for us. Um, that is where receipts from the pool and our cost share for um, summer camp and um, the revenue from ambulance services um, lives. And then if people aren't using services, that number is going to go down. I don't know if the um, slowing of our EMS services during the pandemic is um, ind indicative of what's going to happen as as we move forward, or if it is simply because everybody doesn't, nobody wants to go to the hospital because nobody wants to be around people. Um, but we went from um, billing out usually on a in the month of um, April, we would expect to bill out fifty or sixty thousand dollars. We billed out twenty six thousand um, last month. So we just we want to watch that. That's a four hundred thousand um, dollar revenue um, stream for us. Any questions about kind of the revenue side? You good? All right. Wait, Either boring wait, wait. you. Or, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I couldn't unmute me. You went so so. Sometimes you say like this year. So since <laughs> can so, so in this context, this year, this right, year but, goes to twenty June thirty FY okay. twenty. Next year will be twenty one. All right. Which so, we're working on the budget. Okay. So I'm just kind of work for you switching back and forth when you say this year is it 2021 or is it 1920 like so we're still finishing up this year yeah oh, and and okay. i probably bounce back and forth so i'll pay really close attention to try to keep it that way or say okay this year. how's that all right to that thank you all right so um when we look at um, the budget from the highest level, and we look at um, expenses, we have um, the budget um, as it stands right now is up a total of $192,688 or 1.8%. Um, this, any questions about this before I so if I have been able to get there without doing any operational shifts or temporary um, things that will have to come back, um, I would be ecstatic because I don't think I've ever given you a budget that had a 1.8% expense um, growth in it. The issue that 
that we're running into is that um, we've had years of fiscal constraint. And so most of the contingency um, and funds that for, for lower priority work have been stripped out of the budget already, which uh, reduces our um, flexibility and makes it hard to fund unanticipated needs. The other thing it does is it makes it really difficult to scrape money out of the budget without having to make decisions around services. And I, I feel really strongly that it's my job to give you options and make recommendations if you want to hear them. But that I felt I wanted to not put a budget together that impacted services to the public without council making those decisions. So what is in the budget when you get to, in order to get to that number? Um, I increased the utilization of undesignated fund balance. So we're back at 400,000. So that was $50,000. I eliminated all the appropriations to reserves. So this is the money that we raise and appropriate every year and put into the assigned fund balance to um, pay for future needs. Um, that was about $240,000. We reduced the scope of capital infrastructure projects. Um, the one that you see that is obvious, we went from a $250,000 um, paving road reconstruction project on Forest Avenue from Noise Drive to um, the bridge. And um, that has been changed to a heavy shim and overlay which um, took that from a $250,000 project to $125,000 project. Um, we can't um, eliminate the project completely. Rob is not sure he could plow the road if we didn't at least get an overlay on the road. Um, you're gonna notice that there are not um, other infrastructure projects that have moved. And the reason for that is we have shuffled and shuffled and now um, I have gotten, we're at the point that if we shuffle, there are lots of consequences that come out of that. And so council is gonna have to talk that through with Rob during the capital budget discussion. Uh, I was not comfortable moving any, anything else forward um, to shuffle more. So, uh, yep. The, the project, um, which, what was it, College Heights or Chapel Road? that we had That's, talked about in our last meeting, that is still in the budget? No, that, that um, got moved ahead one, that was already moved ahead one year. Um, okay. That was, I think the thought was that it was gonna take this year to finalize the construction drawings and get it out to bid. So that's in next year's budget. Mm -hmm. Let me, now that I say that, let me just look real quick. So this year's budget, Tom, has the miscellaneous accounts that Rob uses to deal with the, the issues that pop up. Um, it has 400,000 for the second part of North Main Avenue, 100,000 for Main Street sidewalks, which would get us construction um, drawings and potentially um, at least it ready to go out to bid. Um, that 100,000 is all coming out of the downtown and transit oriented TIF. 125,000 on paving on uh, Forest Avenue and 95,000 to pave Godfrey Drive, but that is coming out of the Envision Net TIF. So College Heights and Chapel, Westwood are all happening in 22. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. My pleasure. So, Sophie, could I ask a question real quick? And you may yeah. get to this later. So no, that's all right. if you're going to get to it later, just say, have you, have you been on, I know you've been on state calls with the feds and all of that stuff. Are they, are you anticipating any money coming in from the feds? 
for this uh, for this coronavirus response at all? So I just this afternoon got a letter from the feds that we might get some money as um, reimbursement on the Medicare because we're a service provider, we're a, a health care provider, um, but it doesn't tell me how much. Um, I'm not hearing anything else and it makes me nervous. I saw the governor's task force to reopen the state and it was very noticeable to me that Maine Municipal Association was not invited to that table, which makes me really nervous about the priority that municipalities are gonna get. That answer that question? It's a little nerve wracking. Yeah. So the other thing in the budget um, is the delayed filling of anticipated vacancies. So as an example, um, we have vacancies for two interns that we've come to you and told you how much we need in the budget. We've said we won't, we won't have them this year. Um, we have an anticipated vacancy of a full-time position at the library. In the current budget, it delays filling that position until October 1. And then as your cost cutting a la carte options, it go that another option is to not fill that position. Um, I have made the decision here. Uh, we're working with our top candidate uh, for the uh, rec position. I really want to uh, get a little bit further in the budget before I make a final formal offer there. Um, so it's delaying. Um, the word has gone out that if the department has attrition, unless it's a department that we would have to backfill and spend overtime for, the thought would be that we would look to shuffle existing people to try to meet needs um, and keep positions as vacant as we can until we know what's coming down the line. Um, there is no cost of living increase on the non-union side. Um, the union side, I think you'll find um, both contracts have um, not, their um, wage scales are not COLA, they are finite, um, they're agreed upon salary structures. Um, we did some so on this idea of we're gonna take a pause, we cut some expenditures out of the budget that we normally would fund on an annual basis. And instead, we would say we'll use some reserve funds if we need to. So for example, even with the high unemployment at this point in time, if we're not laying people off, I think we've seen uh, our outside risk on uh, unemployment claims for people who have left us in the last um, five quarters. And they are pretty minimal. Um, our suggestion is that we don't appropriate five more thousand dollars for the unemployment insurance, like unemployment claim that we normally would. And instead, if we, if we have claims, just pay them out of the unemployment reserve, which stands at about $45,000 um, right now. We have, uh, we normally appropriate money for um, the trails, to maintain the trails. Mitch had a nice conversation with our trails chairperson, trails committee chairperson, and what they've said is um, the only thing that we'll do on trails is deal with um, having to rep repair them. So if a bridge broke and it, it was not safe, then we go in and we would repair it. We have a trails reserve. So the thought would be if that happened, we would take the money out of trails reserve. Um, this really does anticipate quite a pause in terms of um, parks and rec services. Uh, cutting back at 
what we put out for Gould's Landing, um, cutting back on the special um, police details for Gould's Landing and the trails. Um, it it um, looks at really returning to those core services. The university contract is still in here to be able to provide um, services for us. They have been providing virtual um, programming for kids during the pandemic, which has been kind of cool. Um, but uh, we are, we, we are still trying to come to terms with whether or not we're going to be able to have a summer camp this year, whether or not we're going to be able to open the pool. If we can open the pool, what does that look like? The state of Maine, DECD can't decide if we should be regulated like a hotel with a pool or like a fitness center with a pool or if they need to make something else up. And um, at this point, we can't open before July 1st anyway. Um, one of the options that we put right out there for you to consider for cost saving or cost reduction is to cut the pool for this year. And to say those six weeks of pool aren't, we won't do that. Um, so those are the kind of the cutting and the pause piece. And then we know that we had, we needed equipment the police chief came to you and asked for um, two cruisers. Uh, he was pleasantly surprised when they were able to put a fairly find a fairly low mileage motor for one of the older cruisers. Um, still, we're still in that risk place of is is it gonna get us through the year? We don't know but we felt like it was reasonable to go back to the um, vendor and see if we could claw those purchases back. We were, we were able to get one of the cruisers back. So in the capital equipment um, plan, you will see one cruiser for this year, two for next year and two for the year after that. Um, and facilities, investments. Um, we know that there are things that we need to do to continue to maintain our facilities that we're just, they're not in the budget. There's nothing in the budget for the Boy Scouts building or the old fire station, which is coming back to us. There's nothing in the budget to do anything further with Marden Park, which is reaching a point where we're going to have to decide what to do with, with that. There's, um, in the budget, we broke up um, carpeting for the municipal building uh, because uh, it is getting to be a safety hazard. The, when they put the uh, carpeting on the second floor of town hall, they glued it down so you can't stretch the carpet and uh, it's starting to peel up and make nice hills for us to trip on. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're delaying. So those I have affectionately called tier one cuts. So all your tier one cuts are in the budget already. You will get a nice little spreadsheet in the front of your budget that highlights those for you. The other, we have tier two cuts. Tier two cuts are those cuts that staff thinks council should have a discussion about and make decisions. That they're still aimed at the pause that council talked about. They're aimed at being able to bring it back so you're not um, damaging the infrastructure or the framework for that um, service. Um, and um, our, it, it's like not ideal, but for a pause, it kind of might make some sense. So for example, on the pause lifts, we have a uh, closure of the ice rink for a season, um, which would save about $3,000. Closure of the pool for the season, which would save a little over $20,000. Um, holding those, um, 
anticipated vacancies unfilled for the whole um, for the whole year, and um, some reductions in departmental service levels. So Rob Yerksa has been very busy, um, and the service level decreases that he has um, in his listing uh, are talking, you know, at this point, we could try to go back to Pine Tree and ne renegotiate our recycling contract and do away with curbside recycling and throw it all in one bin. Um, Rob and I were not ready to do that because we wanted to see data of high recycling rates come through from Coastal before we suggested that. Um, we looked at pay as you throw, that just does not make sense unless you just are trying to pass a fee along to residents. We can't make it pay for the program. Um, so they are, um, there are a variety of cost cutting options there. The tier three options, as I told my staff, they're the things that nobody really wants to talk about or even wants to contemplate, but they are options. So some of those involve laying off staff. Um, I will tell you it taking one person out has the ripple effect in every single department and um, it creates a cascade that has an awful lot of unintended consequences I think. So I have asked each department head to kind of talk through what that would look like um, and they are not things that I am uh, recommending unless you're really looking at pretty significant and permanent service level decreases. Because the other piece you need to understand is that we're, we will be on the hook for that person's, a direct pay for that person's unemployment with a double assessment because of the high economic, the high unemployment. So there are some limits on what we can cut and we have to keep that in mind. Um, Cause oftentimes people have great ideas. Um, so we can't cut or reduce our assessments, the school assessment, the county assessment or our assessment to Orono Vesey Water District. We can't cut or reduce our debt obligation. Uh, we have $716,000 worth of debt that must be paid by the general fund this year and we don't have a choice. I can't cut insurance. I suppose we could go out and see if we could find cheaper insurance. Um, we're getting awful close to the renewal period and uh, we've been satisfied on a cost and a service standpoint from MMA, but um, those premiums are set. We have contractual obligations, everything from labor contracts to employment contracts to vendor contracts. Um, so when you think about kind of, oh, we could do like, oh, we could um, stop curbside recycling. Well, we would have to go back to Pine Tree because we're in the middle of a five-year contract for that service. And we would have to negotiate a change. So there just, we have to keep in mind that there are things we might wanna do that we would have to try to negotiate or um, be at risk of breaching contracts, which would be very costly. And then of course, um, we have mandated services, legal and regulatory requirements, and that is never sexy. That is never um, the stuff that people desperately wanna keep that's you know the MS4 permit and test pits at the landfill and um, just the stuff that has to happen. So the other piece, uh, oh, we're just going to add two um, expenses that are linked to programmatic re revenue. So let me give you an example for that. Um, Jeff and I were talking through if we um, had less people on a shift, what would have to happen? And so 
with that, what would really have to happen is that we would have to stop providing EMS services. So we wouldn't have ambulances anymore. So then we look at, okay, what's the cost associated with that? It's, it, um, the cost associated with the ambulance outside of um, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars a year in um, ex, you know disposable expenses and having to take care of two ambulances and buy ambulances, the the bulk of that expense really is in personnel, right? So you might save um, if if you looked at three people, you know. You, Four people, you'd save three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, and you think, "Oh, wow, yeah, we would lose three hundred and ninety-four thousand dollars of ambulance revenue and for billables, and a thirty thousand dollar contract to VZ to provide EMS services." So you see how those are are linked together? Yes. Okay. Waterfall expenses. I didn't know how else to describe these. Well, yeah. Um, so a water, when I think of a waterfall expense, I look at it as though it looks like it would be something where you could save some money, but in reality, it's really cheap for us to, it's a lot less expensive for us to provide that service. So a good example of a waterfall, I've got two. One would be in public works curbside brush collection. So you think, ah, oh, that's an extra amenity. We would just be able to get rid of that and save some money. The issue with curbside brush collection is that we staff the um, public works department to winter maintenance for winter maintenance. So if you want to look at saving money on brush collection and you're interested in more than the three or five three to five hundred dollars in gas you know gas and diesel expenses you're really talking about people well in order to do that you've got to go to winter maintenance and change the level of service there and then if that happened and we reduced staff over there then we could look at curbside brush collection and our summer services would have to change because we wouldn't have enough people to run them. Does that kind of make sense to folks? So the other waterfall expense, you look at, we evaluated the hazmat team, right? Because not every town has a hazmat team and as much as we really enjoy having it here, would it make sense for us to think about giving that back to the state? So we get grant money, we get um, directed revenue or donations from the university and Penobscot County. And those three things, we charge all hazmat expenses to those that are offset by those three revenue streams. Plus, there is uh, about $17,000 of overhead that we charge off to ha hazmat each year. So if we got rid of hazmat, we would have to turn around and bring $17,000 back onto the general fund budget. So it would actually cost us to get rid of hazmat. Am I making sense? Yes? Okay. So that's how I approach the budget. Do you have questions about that? No? Yes. Yes. Oh, Cindy, go. Oh, no, I was just, um, I imagine at some point we'll talk about what's in the fund balance and so 400,000, how that will affect it. Yeah, so um, absolutely. I've got my little sheet that I usually give you, that little um, grid that, that gives that to you. The other thing to keep in mind with our $10 million fund balance, remember that 1.9 million of that will not be here at the end of next year, FY21, because we had, uh, we've been holding money to pay the balloon payment on the OEDC, the Three Godfrey Drive debt. Um, 
The good news is we have it and it's not in our unassigned balance. The bad news is it's that will be gone. But yeah. yes, um, the other thing I think we should start doing, Cindy, is projecting forward what's gonna happen with fund balance and how much longer we think it will be sustainable. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Cheryl, did you have a question before I went on? Um, yeah, so, so when you talk about the waterfall um, expenses with public works and curbside brush collection and how it affects our winter, um, if things change and shift, I mean, it just, I know, I know it's just a crazy time to be doing stuff like this, but if in the event <laughs> that things, you know, that things shift and revenue picks up and, and things like that, wouldn't it be more, I mean, should we be planning for the present with a, an optimistic look at like the next, like plan for six months and then an optimistic look at like the next six months? So, you know what I'm saying? yeah, so. I, the issue that we have is we can only commit taxes once. Okay. And so one of the things I had a brief call with um, Cindy and Tom, because I am probably being more optimistic than others with regard to the bounce here. Um, and I want to make sure that council understands that there's a risk. But if we let's say you adopt this budget right and it has cuts in it you adopt a bunch of cuts if um revenues come in better than what we're anticipating if this if this just is like a a super ball and hits the floor and rebounds quickly and we're right back where we were and we're bringing in five hundred thousand dollars more than the budget anticipated we you can always restore using the the essentially fund balance because money is going to fly flow into that to replenish replenish it what you can't if we go the other way the only option that you have is to use existing funds more than what we have anticipated or make cuts in the expense budget. Is that making sense? Yeah, thank you, Sophie. <laughs> Sophie, I, I had a question back on uh, the, the comment about no COLA for employees. Um, help me understand exactly what that means. Does that mean that no employee other than the union employees would have any salary increase for next year? No, what it means is um, we said um, no additional seniority steps outside of the union. The union would continue on as, it, as it's in contract, but we said no seniority steps for next year and no cost of living increase for next year. However, we do have some employees that had been promised as part of coming onboarding, as part of their step for employment. Um, they come in at, at a rate in so many months, they get a bump. And if they meet certain licensure, they get another bump. So we've had a few employees that in this fiscal year have been promised um, a step increase next. Not a lot, but we have a few new employees. Um, and my intent would be to honor that. And I have one member of management that has a renegotiated contract that we did six months ago that, um, not quite six months ago, that included a raise on um, July 1 that is in the budget. Is that? Oh, you're, you're. Let me a little different way. How many of our employees would not receive any increase? Approximately. The majority? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
you know, when you ask questions like that, it's really hard for me to figure out where you're going with it, Tom, just so you know. <laughs> uh, just wanting to understand. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. Let me get us back on schedule. We ready to move on? So our projected revenues, um, we had been projected to bring in um, two million four thousand dollars in revenue sharing in FY21 when they when they um, published the state's forecasting um, document um, in March, the beginning of March. Um, that I pulled back to 70% of that, which would be 1.4 million, so $110,000 less than what we brought in, what we were slated to bring in this year. That um, anticipated general fund revenues are down. Um, most of that is in Parks and Rec. Uh, if we're not running summer camp, that's 10 or $15,000. Um, there are, let me just grab my sheet real quick. Um, the pool concessions are, I even if we start in July, we would anticipate we wouldn't have as many people as we normally have. So we've pulled that revenue back quite a bit. Um, we don't, at this point, we're not looking at renting um, space for community events like the Keith Anderson and the Senior Center probably um, until uh, well into the fall and then they're saying we might get another spike in the virus so we've pulled that way back. Um, investment earnings are uh, unfortunately um, slated. Uh, we were getting 1.9% on our investments and we were actually on track to exceed the 110,000 which is wonderful and then COVID-19 hit and we went to 0.45 um, is our new interest rate and when I look at what we've been getting um, that looks like about $22,000 next year is what we should expect. Um, miscellaneous revenue is down primarily um, because of uh, police parking fines. We are finding people are actually complying with the rules and that's a good thing, right? We, that, that's a good thing. Um, and we've talked about the use of funds. So it actually doesn't look all that bad in projected revenue but one of the reasons it doesn't look all that bad is because the homestead reimbursement is um, projected to increase substantially and uh, that's based on the legislature's um, adopting the five thousand dollar increase in the revenue sharing but funding it exemption but funding it completely so the good news is that people who are homesteaders in orono will get an additional hundred and fifty or sixty uh, dollar um, tax relief um, in the coming year. The bad news is that it comes off our mill rate. Um, but so that essentially washes because what we lose on the mill rate we gain in revenue coming in from the homestead. The other place that we're up is in capital revenues. Um, I've in this budget, you will see that I pulled um, $9,000 out of um, hazmat reserve to pay for the first wave of um, replacement air bottles. Um, I pulled $100,000 out of equipment um, reserve in an effort to offset the impact to the tax rate. So and we will hit um, the, the two TIF accounts for paving projects this year. Questions about revenues. Are you guys comfortable with me being optimistic at least until the forecasting committee meets? Yes. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. So, uh, I thought you had something to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm comfortable. I, I'm still optimistic that something might come through one of these surplus package uh, stimulus packages, but we'll see. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so when we look at this, it shows us that our county tax is going up 22, almost $23,000. And the word from the school is that um, their increase is going to be $567,204. So it's an increase on the mill rate of about $2.30. That's the general overview, folks. So, uh, oh, you had it, Tom. Yeah, Sophie, um, help me understand this. We're, we're projecting a um, total community value of 448,139, right? Yep. And one mill would therefore raise $448,000. Is that not correct? Yeah. So if the net increase in the assessment is 770,000. Oh, Tom. I, I think the mill might be off. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. See, two mills would raise, would raise 896,000 by my calculation, and you need to raise 777,000. So I've got math somewhere, Tom, and I've got to look at, Let, um, I've been through that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen with you guys for a minute, okay? So I can yeah. pull something else up. I mean, this is something we have to, you have to resolve tonight, but, but um, by the time we look at the budget again, probably ought to make sure that that's, that that well, is correct, because I think it raises a lot more than 700. Yeah. So, let me, uh, it is not something obvious in the spreadsheet, Tom. So I've got an issue. Sophie, is it some, somewhere? Is it the school, school number was, was higher that you were dealing with? Um, I don't. I don't know. I've had a bunch of people in this spreadsheet, so I don't know if something is carrying wrong um, behind the scenes. I think I see Bell. Yeah, Bell's in it right now, looking. Um, so the answer is Tom. You would, in fact, be doing the right math in terms of a mill should raise four hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars. So let me figure that out. Good. Either the uh, net assessment figure is not right, not correct, or the projected tax rate is not correct. Wouldn't I like to think it's the... Um... Projected tax rate? <laughs> yeah, you know it. Um, I think what I know I have been through with a fine tooth comb is the municipal expense side. And so... I guess one of the questions I have for you is when we think about um, 
cuts to services. Is that something that you, that $187,000 of growth, are you looking to bring that down more or how, how do you want me to approach that to give you the, the tools you need to be able to make some decisions? <laughs> what you're asking us. <laughs> I'm asking, so as an example, um, everything that we do that is not mandatory could theoretically be on the table. If I, if I go out and produce all of the options that you have for cost cutting measures because you're, you want to look at everything, there will be things on there that will just, I think, almost cause more angst because they were there than any, the, any amount of time you would spend dealing with them. I'm trying to get a sense of how much more, if any, you want to come out of this budget so that I can give you options to get to where you're trying to go. Do you see, I'm trying to get a sense of the scale. Sophie, how flexible are the contracts? Like how much wiggle room do you have with Pine Tree? I mean, if you, if you, if you negotiated, instead of trash pickup every, you know, just so, time-wise, like just, you know, um, every other week or, so you know, every we, three weeks, yeah. just something. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, Are you flexible think, enough to do that? I think we'd have some issue. Well, I will tell you, Jim Dunning is, has been great to work with and Pine Tree. I think that, um, I think that the issue comes in for example, for um, trash pickup, not every week. Um, there are some practical issues with that, particularly in the summertime. Um, when we talk about comming commingling, recycling in with trash and eliminating the recycling contract, what I have seen happen with that, other towns have negotiated that, um, but it is not a straight the contract was $45,000, therefore we'll have $45,000 of savings. Because what Pine Tree does is they look at your tonnage and they decide how much more it's going to add to their weekly MSW collection. And what other has happened in other communities is the MSW collection contract gets negotiated higher and the recycling goes to zero. Um, Talking with folks, it seems like it's about a 50%. Um, so when Rob and I ran those numbers, we were looking at that being um, cost cut of about um, $28,000 when everything was said and done a year. But something, it would be something. Well, see, um, and, and yeah, go ahead. That's part of the reason why I guess I'm asking for that scale piece is that if you're looking for 150 or 200,000, then there is a scale of, of cuts that I can provide to you. If you're looking for 500,000, then that's a whole different level of cuts. And quite honestly, if you're not looking at that, I really don't want to put them on paper. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at 500,000. Mm -mm. <laughs> and, and, and the sheet that you gave us on the tier two reasons, um, I would not be in favor personally of closing the pool in the summer if, if we are allowed to have a pool. Um, I think that the youth of our community has been so impacted by schools being closed. I'd, I'd hate to see us further impact them with closing the pool or the ice rink. Um, I think holding vacancies unfilled for the fiscal year is a reasonable thing and that if more uh, revenue came in than we were anticipating in our initial budget, um, we could change that. So, uh, oh, good. So for example, Tom, if we held that vacancy unfilled for the whole year, it would 
result in the library probably only being open five days a week instead of six mm -hmm. and a reduction of hours each day that they were there. But, um, and definitely not growing services, there would be some programming that would get pulled back a little bit. I would want us to talk a little bit with Lori about that because mm -hmm. I think Lori's vision for how the library is gonna come back is different than the rest of the departments. And I think you'd wanna understand how we would be providing services in the coming year anyway. That, that's fair. Yeah, just on the subject of, um, you know, well, are, are folks looking for the $500,000 scale or something? Um, I, I, I agree with a lot of what Tom just said. Um, of course, I, I would like to see, um, you know, and like the specifics of each department. But I mean, my understanding, so the, the, I, the idea of not filling vacancies or holding off on filling vacancies um, is definitely something that appeals to me more than some of the other options. Um, in terms of the looking at that larger scale, I mean, my understanding is that one of our largest um, sort of uh, operational costs is, it has to do with, um, with our staffing, is that correct? Absolutely, that's about, it's when you add up wages and benefits, it's um, about $5.6 million. Right. And so for me, I mean, I, I would, I mean, I would, I would commit, I would want to commit to not making cuts to staff or laying off staff. I mean, I, I feel like one of our greatest resources as a community that does a lot on a very, very tight budget is that we have an incredible staff. And even if we were to make some short term gains, Although what you're saying about unemployment, it's not likely that we would, but even if we tried to make some gains or, or for political purposes, we're trying to look like we were making gains, I mean, we would just be doing our community such a disservice in the long run because someday the ship will right itself, someday things will be better, um, and we will have lost a very valuable resource that we have over other other communities who operate yeah. on larger budgets. So um, that is something that I would, I would absolutely want to commit to upfront is, is not interfering with staff that we have any more than we absolutely have to, just in terms of what you said about COLA, um, but, but to not laying anyone off. Um, and so if, if, if staffing costs are sort of, sort of part of the, the largest chunk of our budget, um, for me, I can't justify even looking at you know, a scale of 500,000 or some, or some larger scale. Right. I agree. I agree with both of those comments. I, I think too that we also need to look at the health of the community as well. So while I use the pool and I have lots of children that I take there usually in the summertime, if it's going to impact the health of our community, um, this is just temporary, you know, I, I would have to say that committing to not laying off staff, but also committing to keeping us safe, mm -hmm. um, for me is also, um, a priority. So, yep. so I, um, I think, uh, from my perspective, um, just like, uh, when the virus, the pandemic was coming towards us and we had to make decisions about how to keep operating and then when to shut things down. And we've, we've tried very hard to follow guidance that has been given to us from, by people who know better than we do. Um, my sense is if there is a um, safe way to open the pool, that is great on so many levels. We're just trying to figure out how we can how we can do that. My other sense is it takes several weeks for us to get the pool open, Cheryl. So we should hopefully be hearing and being able to make that decision before you adopt the budget. And the plan would be if we can't because of health open the pool, then we would be able to find some savings, but, it's a, but we'd keep $7,000 in the budget, which would allow us to open it up for next year. Um, 
to do that work. Right. So it's just, it's an ongoing, it's just an ongoing because yeah. we just don't know. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. I think Bill has an explanation on that text. Yes. So, um, Tom, the mill rate would be just like you thought if our value was the same. But if you think about it, each, so our current rate is 2645. Because our value is going down, that 2645 doesn't actually raise the same amount of money as 2645 with our current FY20 value. It's the difference. That's what? why the delta between the um, between the new tax rate and the FY20 tax rate is not just a dollar seventy. I guess I don't understand that. But so how about how about this? We're going to um, take a look, and I will either have a corrected number for you, or we will drag out the whiteboard and do the math so that Quick. people understand. Um, so the, the plan at this point is um, the numbers shouldn't change all that much, but I am gonna go back through over the next day um, or two and um, double check because I'd much rather know that I made a mistake before I gave it to you as opposed to after. Um, and my plan would be on Monday when we get it back from the printer and Nancy does her magic that we will ask um, someone, either Mitch or a police officer, to um, drop them at your front door. Uh, when they're going out, we will let you know um, so because we will make sure people know that they sh don't need to ring the bell and have a face-to-face -face conversation that work did that happen today or did you get a face-to-face -face conversation tom i got a face-to-face -face. all right I, then I, sophie i've been thinking like a little bit about the prior question and yeah i understand i really don't want to lay off people but i guess i would like to see some options that don't and don't include um laying off individuals but if there's if there's capital <clears throat> um, capital purchases that maybe shouldn't, we need to think about something along those lines. So mm -hmm. what I've got, Cindy, is a grid that will walk you through, this is where, this is the department we're talking about so that we can line them all up and you can review them as you review your departmental budgets. Um, this is in a very, in a phrase, what we're talking about, so how much it, the expense could be reduced. Um, and this is the impact of that reduction. So for some of these, the box just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding, but Rob Bjergsa, um, you know, he likes to make sure everybody knows. Sure. Um, and um, then on the side, if it is um, a significant cut that we think will be difficult to bring back, we we talk about the barriers, what we're concerned about. So for example, breaking the um, contract with the University of Maine for youth sports programming, we put as a tier three cut, it's $15,000, but our assessment is that the university brought, changed somebody's job to be able to help manage that. And if we were to cut that contract, there would probably be ramifications on their side that would make it really hard for us to then turn around and just redo the contract. Does that make yep. sense? Yep. So I'll go through that, but what I'm hearing from you is, um, I at this point, you're, it doesn't sound like people are at all interested in hearing um, about layoffs. And I will tell you, I am, uh, that would, I think that's important that. Yeah, yeah. I think so, that, important to to town staff but in the same vein i also think it's important to our residents that we really look at the budget yep yeah. uh unfortunately i agree with bell <laughs> uh. tax rate 
Um, I was just looking at the increase and I should have been looking at the total commitment and it looks like it is actually 2.29 additional mills, which I think is more than we should have, but anyway. So anything, any final words of guidance, feedback you'd like to give me? Actually, Sophie, I've been said this, I actually probably should have said something a bit earlier, but um, I, I've been for some reason sitting in the back of my head. So when we talk about things that we're looking at, that we cut or whatever, school is never an issue, correct? They, they basically say this is what we, what we want or what we get. And we can't go to them and say, hey, by the way, we're all feeling this really hard time right now. Because I'm going back to when you were kind of like talking about, when we were talking about way back comparing about community and about Hamden and how Hamden was a lot like us um, on, their, on how their budgets are and stuff like that, correct? Was that, that right? But I, I just, as I'm sitting here, I was kind of like doing some statistical numbers and that's a pretty amazing school district in itself. And trying to compare the, the costs associated for all par, I, I, Hamden High School is like 800 kids, class A, um, and, and we are 334 class C, uh, and that's 2.31% higher enrollment. I was just kind of like wondering how, you know, you know, you know where I'm going with this? Like how, how is that that they can take a similar budget and make it work? And we're uh, like 2.3% less or times less. So I am not... Okay, would, you, would you like to jump in front of this truck for you? <laughs> Carrie, <laughs> the only thing that we can do is to talk about what the school is projecting to ask the town to pay them since we are required to pay them exactly what they ask. And once that information is in the community and the school budget is officially out, the town has the right to vote on the school budget, whether to adopt it as proposed. If they see the increase and they don't feel that it's weighing appropriately on the mill rate, they can make a choice to not vote for the school budget or they can say, we're happy with this, this school budget and we will vote for it and then we, the town will pay uh, whatever it is that they bill us for. So the, the only thing that we can do is to just be very upfront about what, what the mill rate is projected to be and what portion of that comes from the school budget and then folks in the community who vote on the school budget can make their decision. Um, I, th I think that's exactly right. But uh, Terry, one of the things that is significantly impacting the budget is the bond payment for con the construction project. Hamden built a, the, the, at the time they built it, the most expensive school built in the state of Maine, and it was almost entirely with state funds. Our construction project is entirely local funds. And that's a huge Thank difference. You. I think I think that well, bond just, like seven thousand dollars. Operating cost was, yeah. I just was looking at the operating costs right. of, of just based on a statement. I get that the school district tells us what um, what the amount is that the community votes on that. I was I just was kind of looking at like when Sophie said that it was a similar budget, um, which I would say is probably historically not just this year. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I know I get, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I'm just saying that it was one of those questions I had that when we we're looking yeah. at having to feel the pain of these things, like exactly looking at that stuff. So yes, well, thank you. What, Terry, one of the things that um, the community already decided. In, in a sense, one of I think what Tom's getting at too is one of the things the community already decided is how much of an increase in the school budget it was willing to swallow. So, and even though we none of us could have predicted the current economic situation, um, part of what we will have to say in our messaging to the community is, um, you know, the community voted for this bond to pass. And now we have to deal with the repercussions of that. And we'll just do the best that we all can, right? And also, I mean, as, as we have public meetings to discuss our budget, so does the school. And so right. please, I mean, it's like, if anyone's out there, <laughs> hello, 
come to these meetings, come to our meetings, go to their meetings, ask questions, get involved. I mean, this is how it works, you know, instead of when it comes to time just to vote or just to sign the check. And if we don't know what's happened and what's gone into it before, then we kind of missed our opportunity, but nothing happens, you know, in darkness here. Everything is, is, is out there just so please go to the meetings, everybody. So the only other piece I would add to that, Terry, is that we are a community of one. So when you see our assessment for schools, it is the entire local share. With Hamden, what I'm telling you they spend on schools is the school assessment for RSU 22. There are other communities in RSU 22. So just for a point of fact. Thank All you. right. How, go ahead. We're good. I promised that these would be short meetings. So, um, so you will get your budget on Monday. If there's anything in there that you're sitting there saying, oh boy, I'm gonna ask this really detailed question about operations or about historical data. If you just wanna shoot that to me so I could actually look intelligent at the meeting, I would appreciate it. Um, but um, I will have all panelists for general government. So anybody that's on that list, all those departments will be available and able to speak at the meeting. Um, the plan is to start and go for an hour and a half or two hours, depending on how long Cindy wants it to go. And then when we break, whatever is left, we'll come back and finish the next, the next day. Okay. okay? Yep. So, Sophie, do you have the PowerPoint on Drive? I can put it on Drive. I can absolutely put that on Drive. I have access to it. Okay, yep. thank you. I can do that. Quick question also, given that we're starting earlier, that's not necessarily giving us the right to go later. This is <laughs> it's not from seven to nine, switching to four to nine. No, no the, the plan that I promised when I said I wanted multiples was that at least from my staff's perspective, Zoom meetings, we're, we're having a lot of them, and um, they are really hard to stay engaged in for a long period of time. So our goal was um, 90, 90 minutes or up to two hours if we had to. We had a little negotiation, Sam, just because Sophie had added a third meeting during the week, and I said, what if we go two hours and cut it down to two meetings? So, so we negotiated. <laughs> But, all right, so if that's all, um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. And all in favor. So we'll Thank see you. you all on Monday. Yep. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye. Bye.